Hello, Mr. Collins. Yeah, that's me. What's going on there, <laughs> Mr. Bob? Pretty good. How are you, sir? Absolutely fantastic. I'm very excited to talk to you about this project because there's a lot of magic in, in every one of these songs that are featured on the album Breathing Through My Ears. It's just amazing how your exploration could actually be an invitation for a new age of sound. Wow. Okay. I never really thought about that. That's an incredible, can I quote you on that? Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'll tell you what, and because when, when I first heard that you guys were from Sacramento, I'm going, oh, okay, it's going to be a California band. Oh my God. You reach far beyond that description. To fuse this sound together the way that you have, you, you all come from different backgrounds, but yet it sounds like that you've lived this life before, basically. Well, I've been very, very lucky to be able to put together musicians that have been around the block a few times. This is all, none of us actually is, is our first rodeo. And as a result, they all have these wonderfully disparate influences to draw upon. And then when I come in and say, hey, let's 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 do a song in this vein or let's do a song about this subject matter, um, I can usually start off with a little bit of a bass line or an idea. And then they add their their flavor, their 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 a bit of their soul. Yeah. And the result is this wonderful melange of interests and influences. And it comes up with one of those things where one and one equals three. Well, speaking of soul, you must have been reading my notes because Cry a Million Tears, I, I right away I go, love the mood of this song, the emotion and the soul in that voice. Oh, he's like a warm blanket, isn't he? <laughs> that's 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 our our uh, our our wonderful Hans Eberbach, who is sort of a of a staple of the Sacramento music scene, uh, one of our undiscovered treasures in the area. And he can do literally any style of music and make it immediately recognizable, immediately um, comfortable. And his range is, is just amazing. Mm -hmm. We, when both emotionally and, you know, physically. So when we're recording, it's never a matter of trying to find a take that will work. It's a matter of, oh, God, out of these five amazing takes, which one do I choose? <laughs> yeah, that's that's for future use when you go back there and remaster it, in, you know, 25, 30 years from now. <laughs> there we go. We'll do alternative mixes. <laughs> well, with a song like Crime Million Tears, it, I, I, I see top 40 radio here. I see adult top 40 radio here. I see a total crossover song. That's... You know, to be honest with you, we weren't really trying for that. Uh, what we were trying to do, <laughs> this was my poor imitation of a Mark Cohn song. Mm -hmm. um, it, he's been a huge influence on me as a writer, and we just wanted to try something in that style, but also fuse it with lyrics from somebody like uh, Fish from Marillion yeah. and see what type of hybrid we'd be able to create. And then everything else just sort of came together and it just felt really good. And we're very, very much looking forward to playing that one live coming up soon. When you're building a song like this, I mean, you don't just go in the studio as one big band and build it. Well, how, how did you guys piece it together? Was it one track at a time, one, one, in, you know, one vocal at a time? What, what happened? In the case of uh, most of the Breathing Through My Ears sessions, those were written essentially over two weekends wow. uh, back in 20 and 21. And I will usually have ideas for the songs, like either subject matters, uh, styles, this, this sort of like a bucket list kind of thing. And, and then the, uh, three pr principal songwriters, myself, Jerry Merrill on keys and Chad Quist on guitar will sort of jam these ideas out and I'll keep the record button engaged, yeah, yeah. capture it all. And then it's my job to go through and sift for gold yep. and I will go through and find what I like to keep, what I don't want to keep, which isn't really that much because these guys are so good. And then those pieces then become the song. At that point, I'll write lyrics for it and then present it to Hans. And then the two of us will sit there and try and shoehorn what I've written into the music that we've written. That is so interesting that you do it that way because, you know, you're right, capturing sound. You, you just turn it on and totally ignore that the machine is going and really go in there and allow basically the universe to step through and, and throw the, you know move through those instruments. Absolutely. And like, you know, like I said, each one of the guys in the band have such a depth and breadth of knowledge mm -hmm. that there really isn't anything that they can't do. 
you know, I can say, hey, let's do a samba, and they'll know how to do it. Or let's do big band jazz. Bam, they've got it. Let's do a stanky funk. And <laughs> yeah, well, they're on it. You, you got to love that kind of flexibility because, I mean, we, we listen to music that way. We, we I mean, once that iPod came into our life, I mean, we had a whole bunch of sounds coming through at one time. That's the thing that most record companies, I completely agree with you, and that's the thing that most record companies don't seem to realize. Record companies in the music industry overall seem to want to pigeonhole artists mm -hmm. to a tremendous degree. As a result, you know, you have metal, and then there's death metal, and then there's grunge metal, and then there's um, alt metal, or new metal, or active rock, uh, progressive rock, neo-progressive rock, you know, blue-eyed soul, funk. Yep. No, forget about that. But they don't realize is that most people have all of that in their their record collection. They could be listening to country one song, to pop music to another, to R and B, to hip hop. Oh, so true! It is all there. It is such a gift. The name of the album is "Breathing Through My Ears." I love the album cover in the way that it's got a lion on it, and lions are my totem animal. The lion is actually our mascot. Really? Um, he was on the first album, uh, which is called Johnny on the Spot, and he is our dandy lion. So the first album actually had him in sort of like an 18, uh, 1800s waistcoat and uh, tails and a top hat and everything. So he's a dandy lion. And then this one just sort of ties in with the snorkel and, um, <laughs> and diving goggles that are on him um, as breathing through my ears. And actually, I had a lot of fun drawing that album cover. <gasps> I hadn't been able to do illustration like that in many decades. And so uh, I was able to actually go back and revisit some old skills and actually really had a lot of fun. That's got to that's gotta be a, a, a cool journey to take because there for a while, the record company was in charge of everything. And, you know, basically show up, do the music, go on the road. And I mean, I, I love the idea that everybody is working together on these projects nowadays. Yeah, well, actually, I am the record company. So, yeah, I still do everything. Um, but yes, the, the nice thing about this is that each one of the band members can contribute their little bits, go away. I put together things to get all this stuff together, mix it into a recipe, and then move forward from there. And then... Um, I don't actually have to ask a record company to say, hey, can you please do a record al yeah. or, or an album cover for me? And then they come back with something that may or may not reflect what I'm trying to get at and that they're going to charge me ridiculous amounts of money for. I'd rather keep it a cottage industry where we have better control and we can make sure that the quality is as much as high as we can get it and the results are truly reflective of what we're trying to achieve, the stories that we're trying to tell, the emotions that we're trying to portray. So now I've got a whole completely different vibe because the very second when you when you talked about that you that you're the record company and that you know that you, you're in control now I sit here and I want to know the deeper story was there an inspiration from the group Toto because Toto was a group of studio musicians as well that all that just happened to come together and create this sound. Yeah, Toto is an absolute guilty pleasure of mine. Uh, I have virtually all of their records. Yeah. Uh, one of the strangest things is why people don't consider Toto to be a progressive band, because they, they, they literally are. They have one foot in pop, one foot in rock, one foot in progressive. They do a lot of different things, and every album seemed to grow on the last, and that that's the definition of progress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you sit down with Frank, do you ever just want to get inside his head and see, you know, I mean, because the guy obviously has a masterpiece of an ear and to be able to get in there and, and because what, what is it about those, the, when they go in there for that final mix, the mastering, that they hear things that the average person can't? He amazes me every single time. Um, there is something about, well, you know, he's done a lot of work with Steve Lukather. He's oh, done a lot of work with Toto and uh, all these bands and Rick Springfield and just all these, all these uh, incredible platinum, golden platinum records. And he's got all of this, this ear that he's developed over time where he'll hear things that I don't even hear. Yep. It's like, Oh yeah, there, there was a, there was a, a, a mosquito farted in the next room <laughs> and uh, we're going to have to take that out of the mix. Like, Really? <laughs> he drives me nuts with that kind of stuff. But the <laughs> result is that everything sits in its place. Everything is has its own niche. Everything has its own sound. And it all works harmoniously. And it all works to serve the song. Everything he does is always done with a view towards serving 
the song. Wow. It's wonderful. So where's your favorite place to listen to the music? Is it right there in the studio as it's happening or at, you know when you when you're doing a playback or when you go to the car and and you listen to it inside, you know, the the, the doors of that car? Well, he, you know, we don't do that anymore. Uh, what he does when he's mixing, you know, is he has the car stereo there. He what? has the boombox there. He has the home stereo speakers oh there. He God. has the big studio monitors. And when he's mixing, it, he plays through it all. <laughs> and at some point, he kind of comes, okay, this is where it's sounding good on everything. Now, when I heard it first, I listened to it in my studio. And... Um, you know, sort of the litmus test was whether the hairs stood up on the back of my neck. And he never <laughs> failed to achieve that result. I love that stuff. You love to play with your fans as you invite new fans in, like uh, hiding uh, some uh, some rush Easter eggs in your music and, and they, can, they can reach out to you? Yes. The whole idea with Cry a Million Tears was that we were following on the success of another song we had written called No Words, That's it. which was a tribute to Neil Peart and then after his untimely passing. And all the members of the band are very much big rock fans. Uh, and so what we decided to do was to make it a little bit of fun and show our respect for, you know, the boys from up north and put Easter eggs within the video <laughs> that if anybody can go through the video, they see the Easter eggs, make a note of it, email us at info at the and if you get them right, we're going to send you a free download of the entire album. Wow. Wow. See, that's that's what it's all about. It's about making it fun the way that we, you know, when Kiss used to put all those little specialty features inside the inside of that album. Yeah. You remember being able to get your, your album, the smell of opening up the gatefold, oh, having yeah. the, the, the plastic come off, pulling out the vinyl, pulling out the, de the dust cover on there, all of the, the lyrics, all of the credits. I used to devour that stuff. Yep. Who was playing on what? Who was engineering what? What type of bass were they playing? What type of guitar? <laughs> um, you know, and then being able to actually read the lyrics as you're listening to it <laughs> and getting in trying to get inside the mind of the songwriter yeah yeah well you definitely get inside the the mind of of those that visit your web page i mean you guys make that thing fun fun up to date it's 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 very interactive well thank you we've recently redesigned that is actually sort of the highlander company records 2.0 and we are hoping that more people will visit it yeah, they they need to because you guys are very adamant in and keeping it up to date, especially when that's where I learned that you are a professional dad joke man. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's 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 an affliction. You know, they have a twelve step program for it that uh, I've been in, and I'm, I, I'm sad to say it's not been successful. <laughs> when 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 you release or you know kind of be and you, you're basically um, you know allowing yourself to be real on Facebook like that, doesn't that make a, a stronger connection with the fans? That's what we're hoping. Um, we've never been one for artifice or for a huge distance between ourselves and the people that were, that listen to us. We want them to know who we are. We want them to know what we're thinking. We want them to know what the music, where the music is coming from. That way, hopefully they'll have a greater uh, appreciation and they'll, they'll actually listen to it more. Do you think Getty Lee has been on that website yet? Wouldn't it be nice if, if he did? Uh, yeah, that would be a dream. <laughs> um, he was a huge influence on me as a bass player, especially as a teenager. Oh, of course. Um, yeah, there, there's folks associated with the Rush organization that have reached out and uh, expressed their, their gratitude and their, their appreciation for what we did with the No Words video and, and the fact that we were able to raise money for Neil's glioblastoma research fund at Cedar sinai But, um, you know, Alex and, and Getty are retired now, yes. and I don't begrudge them that one bit. They, they earned their retirement. They earned their peace. Let them go have fun, write books, travel, do whatever they want to do. I guess now they've put up mustard. <laughs> yeah. So now, now they're mustard kings. <laughs> One of one of the things that I that I've always learned about about having a fascination and a love for Rush is that is that mo more fans don't know about their early days. I'm from Montana, so we used to listen to the Canadian stations. That's how I got my Rush before they were Americanized with Tom Sawyer. Um, but I mean, it's I just I just wish people would go deeper into the history of the band so they can appreciate them even more. Yeah, their 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 journey through all of the various 
sort of phases of their career, constantly adding to what they've done before, yeah. constantly learning, constantly growing uh, is absolutely a source of inspiration. Yeah. Well, what about you guys, too? I mean, I mean, you're, you're learning from each one as well. Well, we're trying. Yeah. <laughs> do you turn into perfectionists or, or do you just say, no, 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 wait a second. We're going in here with an open mind. We are absolutely going in with an open mind. We'll never get perfection. We're not even really trying. What we want to do is continually grow. You yeah. know, I'm only in competition with myself. Yeah. I want to be a better musician than I was yesterday, a better songwriter, a better producer, a better engineer. That's all I want to continue to learn and grow. Julia Cameron from The Artist Way, um, she, she talks about that musicians especially, as well as uh, writers, need to show up every day. No matter what, show up. You may have to lower the bar, but you have if, if you're going to do it and do it right, you've got to show up. Do you believe in that theory? Yeah, I do. Creativity is a muscle. It yes. has to be exercised every day. Absolutely. Oh, Bob, where can people go to find out more about you? Because, I mean, hopefully, hopefully, you guys are going to be getting over here on the East Coast. Oh, that's that's definitely the plan. Um, so, if, you know, in order to find out about us, look for us on YouTube, uh, the Graffenberg Disciples. Look for us on social media. We're in just about everywhere, um, kind of like American Express. And <laughs> um, and then, of course, the website is www.thehighlanderco.com. That's T-H-E-H-I-G-H-L-A-N-D. E-R-C-O dot com and uh, drop us a line. We'd love to hear from them and uh, check out everything that we've got going. We've got a number of different off- offerings. Absolutely. And go to the Facebook page. You will be entertained. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Dude, please come back to the show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Well, you be brilliant today, okay? Okay, you do.